your people will have to follow my instructions to the letter. <laughs> HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen. Feminists have never had a favorable outlook on masculinity. From the 19th century, they viewed men through the same set of lenses. The presumption of malice or contempt as the motive behind all men's choices. The presumption of apathy or callousness as men's primary level of sensibility or insight. And the presumption of dysfunction as the primary characteristic of men's responses to their environment and their social experiences. If we lived in a society built by the men feminists described, we'd all be dead. Early feminist writings rely on blaming all of society's ills on the condition of men being in charge, while ignoring social standards that made them responsible for, and to, women. That garbage is what 20th century feminists fleshed out and labeled patriarchy theory, despite a lack of any scientific validation that would merit calling it anything more than a hypothesis. The patriarchy conjecture relies on its own set of lenses. Feminists call positions of responsibility and the related expectations of agency power because such positions were mostly held by men, while ignoring the fact that social influence strong enough to compel choices made by people in positions of responsibility is also power, because that power is held mostly by women. It's much harder to write a victim narrative around gender differences in choice of what kind of power to wield and how it is wielded than it is to write one around one sex being actually powerless, so they had to define power to exclude women's preferred uses of it. When discussing historical gender roles, they view women only as controlled victims of social standards they've influenced, while viewing men only as culpable for them and beneficiaries of them. In discussing standards they consider unfair to women, they ignore how men's responsibilities shape those standards, as well as the prevailing characteristics that would historically be attributed to mature adult masculinity. They cannot grasp how a tool for meeting one's responsibilities, like toughness when one's capacity to work is hindered by suffering, could be beneficial to the individual and community despite its ability to also be taken too far. They are unable or unwilling to recognize that any feminist-approved female behaviors could also be taken too far. Using those methods of selective focus, 20th century feminist academic Raywin Connell created the terminology and rhetoric of the toxic masculinity narrative. Connell's 1985 paper, Theorizing Gender, laid the groundwork for labeling dysfunctional behavior among men and boys gender norms and attributing it to neutral standards of maturity, like stoicism or ruggedness. Its text reads like a rewording of everything memory hold radical feminist Andrea Dworkin liked to say about men and masculinity, pushed through a filter of Marx's theories on cultural hegemony. Today's feminists rely on Connell's watered-down, man-hating Dworkinisms to excuse imposing their own gender stereotypes on men and boys, just so that they can claim the entire male population is tainted with social dysfunction for which feminist ideologues hold the cure. Gender studies professors have made entire careers out of this. A lot of academic writing on the topic traces back to Connell's Dworkinisms, often citing Connell but rarely ever mentioning Dworkin. Every time men or boys face a hardship, have a need, or express any kind of self-interest, feminist writing has a disparaging answer for them. Hundreds of young disciples have swallowed it without question and are waiting to vomit it at them from every angle. None of them are interested in actually doing anything to help. Many of them probably don't even know the origins of their claims, only that they are the accepted politically correct view of masculinity in their chosen academic or professional fields. They know such claims sell books to young feminists, that they are useful justifications for the creation of programs and employment positions that make them money. That is all they need to know to become die-hard disciples of the church of what's wrong with men now. Remember our discussion last week about dehumanization and state violence? As we continue trudging through the mud flung by feminists trying to gender the COVID-19 crisis, listen for that dehumanization in the narrative that video spins. What purpose would a group of ideologues have for tearing down the characteristics of adult maturity upon which our civilization was built? What would be the point 
of blaming victims of social stereotyping for the hardship imposed on them by common social attitudes. How is it helpful for community leaders to use the pandemic as a means of escalating tensions and animosity between the sexes rather than as a means of inspiring teamwork and mutual consideration? How naked does the onslaught of anti-male denigration have to become before we're allowed to call it hate? How many times do I need to ask? Have you had enough? This week, Deborah Pawnee joins HBR Talk to continue our examination of the feminist report, Masculinities and COVID-19. How much can we trudge through this time? Listen in and find out. The discussion streams on multiple platforms. You can tune in to the YouTube live stream via the link in the low bar or find other viewing and listening options on badgerfeed.com.